Okay, so I've been queued to actually start. Um, so, good afternoon. Welcome to the panel on race today and student activism. Coming from the SNCC and NAACP roundtable, it is critically important to see how undergraduates are continuing the fight for liberation and freedom across college campuses in Rhode Island. My name is Shamara Wiley Al Hassan. I'm a fifth year PhD candidate in the Africana Studies Department at Brown and a longtime student activist. I am proud to listen to these students talk about their experience with activism on campus, and I'll briefly introduce the panelists, and then we will begin to listen to their presentations. After their presentations, I'll ask one or two questions, and then we'll open it up uh, to the audience. And I'm going to introduce uh, folks in the order that they will do their presentations. So Meg Deladinko um, is a senior in international business with a minor in Chinese at Roger Williams University. On campus, they are a peer mentor, a critical social justice peacemaker, the coordinator of the Asian Rice Bowl Affinity Group, and a member of the Counseling Center Student Advisory Board. Off campus, they are involved in the Leukemia Lymphoma Society in terms of raising funds for blood cancer research, the Tomorrow Fund, and the co-founder of the Patients Outreach Services Hand in Hand Heroes. They are passionate about working towards the inclusive, inclusivity of feminism in regards to POC and marginalized groups and the decriminalization of sex workers. Besides dismantling white supremacy, cis heteropatriarchy, and capitalism, they love animals, cooking very spicy foods, taking 10 hour naps, makeup, skincare, writing, and playing video games. Our next panelist is Adriel Antoine, who is a senior at Providence College with a double major in political science and sociology with a minor in French and black studies. He is the president of the Providence College NAACP chapter, a founder, mem founding member of the Board of Representatives, as well as Horizons Coordinator, a year-long retreat program geared toward multicultural student access. Upon graduating from Providence College, Adriel will be pursuing his Master's of Education in the Student Affairs Administration Program at Michigan State University with an assistantship as an assistant community director. It's amazing. Uh, Willow, and then our next uh, panelist is Willow Matos, is a junior uh, from the University of Rhode Island with a major in Africana Studies. She serves as the Community Service Chair of Pink, Powerful, Independent, Notoriously Knowledgeable Woman, student, and she's a student leader for URI Alternative Spring Break, Poverty, and she works on community revitalization through Baltimore as a URI 101 mentor. Being involved in service has helped her gain a sense of self and find a love for people and their stories. She continued doing service while being a, being a full-time student because it gives her the space to think critically and ask herself the tough questions people don't want to talk about. Our next panelist is Yohaida Heredia, um, who is a freshman from Providence, Rhode Island, attending the Community College of Rhode Island. She is a youth ambassador at Initial Women's March on Washington, Rhode Island, Rhode Island Rally, and director of STEM Girls of Color program at Times Square STEM Academy in Providence. She was a participant in Black Women and Girls Symposium Research Collaborative in 2017. Having a voice and a seat at the table with so many empowered and passionate black women has taught her so much. She loves being involved and having a voice because for so long it, it was that she couldn't find her own. So it's important that she is a voice for young girls who are still troubled with finding one in their communities. She believes it's time to take initiative on our campuses. And our last panelist is Gwen Magodi. Um, who's an international student from Zimbabwe, graduating from Brown this May with a degree in Africana Studies and Literary Arts. She's a storyteller at HERE, and she's always thinking of how to engage the world through visual, oral, or written stories. In her own intellectual work and in her activism, she is particularly interested in the unsaid, the people and experience that are either intentionally omitted or that are too far on the margins of society that they are simply forgotten in how we represent the world in narratives we tell each other. So please give a round of applause for our team. Uh, so 
Meg, if you want to start. So. So I come from Roger Williams University, and as some of you may know, it is located um, in Bristol, Rhode Island. And just to give a quick overview, I know some of you may know this already, but Bristol used to be one of Bristol used to be one of the biggest um, areas in New England for the slave trade. Um, it was headed by the De Wool family, if I'm not mistaken, and it it really helped the economy of New England prosper. Basically. Um, profiting and capitalizing off the bodies and the work of uh, black African American individuals. So with that being said, it is kind of obvious if you go to Bristol or to Barrington, which is right next to the um, university, that that place is very affluent. It's filled with a lot of white people and it's also very reflective on the university as well because a great portion of the university comes from Rhode Island in itself, from Barrington, Portsmouth, and just generally within the area. So Roger Williams is number 2,181 out of 2,718 colleges in terms of diversity. So in other words, that means it's low. It's almost non-existent. Um, in terms of the student population, um, it is 74.5% it is white. And for faculty, it is 87.1%. Um, so just basically, it's just you go into a classroom and I would be the only person of color, and I would probably be the only Asian individual in like a whole year of my classmates within my major. That's basically what it's like. And to base it off my own experience, um, I've had I've been studying for seven semesters there already, and I've had around 35 classes. Only three of those professors there are Asian identifying, so that's around nine percent of my classes. If you're very giving with your mathematics, only 9% of my classes were taught by people who look like me. So I was really interested in, well, in my first two years, I really tried to assimilate to the white, cult the white culture on campus. But as the semesters progressed, I realized that I was not succeeding in, in my um, situation as a person of color, student of color on the campus. So I applied for the PEACE program, and basically the PEACE program is an acronym for Peer <laughs> Empowerment, Activism, Advocacy, and Community Engagement. And it is a critical social justice peer mentorship group that is dedicated towards um, providing education for freshman students and first year students to gain cultural literacy and fluency through seminars, outreach, and a bunch of other activities in which they can develop their own knowledge of critical social justice. Because a lot of people believe that just social justice is just a participation of all groups and social identities um, in a society that is mutually, what did I put here? Mutually shaped to fit everyone's needs, but for critical social justice, we try to look at the broader frameworks of things, like how are the how is the system built to systematically oppress the people already living at the margins? And how does it keep the people in power, in power and comfortable? So we try to teach these freshmen and these first year students about this. And also, besides the peace program that I'm in, I'm also uh, the coordinator for the Asian Rice Bowl Affinity Group. And basically, as I said earlier, it's such a small percentage of people who look like me on the campus. So I tried to make a sort of community where we could bring not only the um, Asian identifying American students together, but also the international students who actually came here to the US from what they've told me um, to talk with people who like spoke English. So they wanted to learn more about so-called white culture, if that makes sense. So I was trying to bring them all together. So we tried to find like a sort of basis where we could all connect. So it was mostly around food because they were tired of the food that was being served on campus. So we, I tried to create an environment where we could bring in Asian food, where we could connect and all that. And also part of the peace program that we were in, we, we started the fireside chat. Basically we partnered up with President Farish and the CDO, the Chief Diversity Officer, Dr. Ame Lambert, in creating a sort of space where the community could all come together and we could talk about certain issues, about the issue of diversity on our campus. Why is there, why is our, why are we living in the margins? So we had talks about race, uh, retention, and critical mass. 
And we try to engage the community and also the board, the administration. We even try to reach out as well to the board of trustees who hold the policy of the university to broaden this, to basically allow the students of color and people who live within the margins to be able to exist without having to be apologetic for it. So that is my little spiel. Thank you. Adriel Antoine. Um, hi, so like I said previous, my name is Adriel Antoine. I'm a senior at Providence College. Um, I have a brief PowerPoint presentation that I had. Um, our group, the Board of Representatives, we made this PowerPoint for um, a conference that we presented at in Chicago um, last year for the Black Lives Matter conference. Um, I won't be going through the whole thing. Um, I'll be skipping around just because of um, the time limit that we have. But um, basically, our presentation last year was on how to maintain a college movement, a uh, social movement on college campus. And we hopefully covered that in this PowerPoint. Um, again, we won't be breaking into groups, but this portion, um, we had four different scenarios that we broke people into, and these scenarios were actual instances that happened on our campus, and um, our task for the audience, our group, was to tell them, for them to tell us how they would address the social movement. Um, so, next slide, please. so, how I guess my social activism, or our group social activism started on campus um, was pretty well aligned with the University of Missouri. Um, the semester before that happened, in the spring of my freshman year, a friend and I um, started the NAACP chapter on our campus. And when the University of Missouri was just getting um, their social movement started, that's when our group officially got approved by um, our student congress. So um, that following day, we basically said we might as well um, hold a solidarity protest with uh, the University of Missouri because they're going through the same things that we kind of go through on our campus. And same thing as another panelist has said, the, their campus as well. We um, face kind of the same issues with diversity and just being able to be ourselves and be comfortable with ourselves on campus since those spaces usually aren't provided for us. Um, so after our protest at um, University of Missouri, there were actually students from residence halls yelling the N-word at us and different things like that. Um, and the president of the school, different members of the board of trustees, um, our safety and security and different administrators were also at this protest. It was at midnight and um, nothing really happened from that. Like people are yelling the N-word at us and uh, um, I think coincidentally, um, all the administrators and the president didn't hear the N-word get said. So, um, at least the next one, six days of silence. It was six days later, we're waiting for the president to address it, and nothing happened. So um, the NAACP and a couple faculty members called together the different presidents and vice presidents of um, groups on campus that are, represent students of color, and we decided to have a silent protest. So what we did was we taped PC Break the Silence on all of our mouths um, to represent Providence College breaking their silence, because. A reoccurring theme is that things will happen on campus, but they'll handle it behind the scenes, they'll brush it under the rug, and then they'll move on. So um, that next day, we went to the president's office and we sat in, and it was, I would say, a good amount, like 80 people were with us that day. And we sat in, people told their grievances, they told their stories as to why like Providence College made them feel so compelled to do something like this. And um, from there, we were granted access to a cabinet meeting which is with all the vice presidents and the president. And there we prepared student demands that we um, presented there, which can be found on the demands.org. Um, and I guess a quick <laughs> overview of those demands. We asked for diversification of the um, curriculum, diversification of the staff and, um, and the um, faculty. We asked for a vice president of diversity because um, we have a chief diversity officer, but that position wasn't at any cabinet level meeting. So whenever large decisions with the school were being made, diversity wasn't a thing that was part of those discussions. So um, that was one of the harder things we had to fight for, which we recently had got um, this past year. Um, but things along those were within our demands. It's a 10 page document, so I don't want to um, spend too much time on that. Um, I want to skip the video that we have as well, too. But um, this kind of goes towards 
the documentation thing that um, I think we're going to all be talking about later on about how to keep movements alive, you have to have it documented in different places so that um, administration can't really hide what's going on. Like this is on YouTube. We have different hashtags for Twitter, Facebook, and different things like that. We have news articles on us. So the, literally these stuff are immortalized and it cannot be ignored. When I graduate in a couple weeks, they can't say that these things didn't happen because there are pictures, there are everything about this that keep it alive. Um, so next slide, please. And um, yeah, so even our group, we hold ourselves to a mission statement. So um, I guess a little bit more history of Providence College. What, again, with ha what happens is racist incidents or just bias incidents in general would happen and then anyone who ends up dealing with it would be a graduating senior or be a junior. So any um, progress that's made would be a private meeting with the president, maybe some vice presidents and a senior. They leave the next year and nobody really knows what happens so there's nothing to build off of. So we made the Board of Representatives and basically we're represented throughout just about every club on campus, if not definitely the groups that um, represent people of color. And um, whenever anything happens, we're usually the first ones to know. We usually know before the school knows so that we can ourselves record it down and we can also strategize as to how we could, um, we should, I guess, address that situation, whether it's a protest, whether it's um, a meeting with different um, stakeholders in the schools, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the strategy, I think um, it speaks for itself. Whenever you're in a social movement or anything that's of this magnitude, you need to know what you're doing, you need to have a plan because um, especially with things like systematic oppression and racism, it's so, it's so organized and like intentional and well thought out. If you're not doing the same thing when trying to combat that, you're not gonna get anywhere. So um, in accordance to our mission statement and like the things you'll see in the next few slides, we were very meticulous with how we address things because I think that people are very meticulous when they try and hold us back. So. Again, just matching the same energy that we receive ourselves. Next slide, please. Um, so a little bit with how we strategize. Um, our group meets bi-weekly, the Board of Representatives. is about nine of us. Um, we try to aggregate ourselves throughout all the classes. So there's three seniors, um, three juniors, freshmen, and sophomores. And every year we'll, um, I don't want to sound creepy, but we'll surveil, we'll watch freshmen who, I guess, um, show some type of like enthusiasm and pride and some type of knowledge about social movements or just um, the struggle in general so that we know that these guys are um, prepared to take on what this um, requires because being entrenched in this, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of hours, sleepless nights and um, extra things that you didn't really sign up for when you first thought you were going to college. Um, so in terms of adding people on, we're, we're also very intentional with who we select because not only is this work important, but we went to college to get our diploma to get education. So we can't just strictly focus on this and let our grades slide because at that point, you're losing any type of clout or any type of meaningfulness that you have if you're flunking out and you're failing. So um, that's like a very um, complicated process as well. A power map is very important because at first we were, um, focusing our energy on people who really couldn't do things. Like the president of the school has power, but he can't really move any ways when it comes to faculty because they have tenure and different things. So we have to learn who to focus our energy on and where to actually, um, where to, I guess, focus our um, movement, focus our, um, I'm losing my words, which I think you guys understand what I'm saying. Um, we have to be intentional with what we did because if we were wasting our time going to the president's office to ask for things when somebody else could actually do it, um, again, we're just, in terms of the time committed to this thing, it wouldn't be um, as cost effective. Um, we can skip the rest of this slide. Thank you. Let's skip, skip them. Um, and then, I guess things like this, um, the tactics that you use are also meaningful. Like our first protest that I mentioned when we taped our PC break the silence over our mouth. Um, I forget which photo it was in, but you see the symbolism like, of that with 80 to 100 students of color with that taped over their mouth. And to walk through the student center, to walk through 
um, the administrative building and to see all these people and you can just literally see the pain with just PC Break the Silence and um, to see that spread around um, basically almost the country because we were trending on Twitter for a good amount of times when we had our sit-ins and stuff. So um, again, with the documentation and the immortalizing, people around the country or even around like the local area, whenever you see PC Break the Silence on Twitter repeatedly, people contact us and be like, is something happening? Because they know what that means. So it's, it's hard for an institution to keep their control over you if other people outside have their influence coming in as well. Um, and you can skip the rest of this. So yeah, so those last few things that are there, learn and adapt and self-care, mental health. Basically, those are just things that we had to learn along the way. Um, learning, adapting, you can't, you can't be stubborn with how you approach things. Sometimes you'll come on to something and you'll realize this is the best way to approach it. So you have to be able to self-reflect and be able to um, see the best way <clears throat> that you should approach, again, the situation. And the self-care mental health, like I said, this is very grueling and long work. So you have to be able to sit back sometimes and just disconnect from things or whatever you guys do yourselves to take care of yourself. Because if you start to deteriorate inside yourself, then you won't be able to give a voice to other people who don't have that voice as well. Because if you're not set yourself, then how are other people at the school, how are the people that are your, I guess, your constituents supposed to be able to rely on you if you can't rely on yourself? So um, I went through that really fast, but that's basically my presentation. So our next speaker is Willa Matos. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Willa. And um, basically, I'm just going to talk about my background and what I do. Um, I was born and raised in Providence, um, Rhode Island. And um, I'm majoring in Africana Studies at the University of Rhode Island. Um, my love for advocacy and change sparked when I was in high school. I was a part of a nonprofit organization called Youth in Action. Um, and I was, the, I was on the board of directors there. And um, I was also part of a group called Students Constructing Classrooms. Um, where we co-facilitated cl um, classes um, at, at Rhode Island College about being a student of color and what we needed from our teachers in order to be successful. Um, so coming to college, I felt very over overwhelmed and lost, um, and I didn't know how I wanted to spend my college career. So sophomore year, I made it a mission to get involved, and um, I did that through service. Um, I joined a program called Civic Engagement Leaders, um, CELS, which allowed me to get academic credit um, while being in charge of volunteers on service projects, facilitating icebreakers and reflections. Um, and then throughout that opportunity, I learned about alternative spring break trips. And my first trip, I decided to go to Atlanta, which focused on the issues of poverty and community revitalization. On this trip, we volunteered at shelters, rehab centers, food banks, and food pantries. And I found a new passion for homelessness. Um, and I grew a lot from this trip and um, from speaking to individuals that were facing homelessness and um, living through that struggle every day. Um, I was asked to return on the trip, but to be a, a leader. So I was in charge of organizing this trip for 26 individuals, um, including staff and students. Um, and we decided to go to Baltimore um, this spring break, which was quite interesting. Um, we continued the same issue area, and um, we ended up learning about more issues such as gentrification. We had a connection on our trip with John Hopkins, and we got a tour. We were able to see the impact of a university, uh, the university has on a city. Uh, and in that impact. And then we were also able to talk about social justice issues such as Black Lives Matters and um, police brutality. Um, majority of those trips are of, um, of white people because of, it is a privilege to go on those trips. They do cost money. And unfortunately, people of color especially um, have to work um, during that time. So it's not, I'm usually, the, usually in those spaces the only person of color. Um, and I was the only woman of color on that, um, as a leader. And, and there was three in-state trips, one out of the country, and two in Rhode Island, and I was the only one. Um, and this year, I decided to be the community service chair of a multicultural organization called Pink Women, Powerful, Independent, Notoriously Knowledgeable. 
And I was, um, we're all about young, mentoring young women in the community and preparing women for the workforce. workforce. So we um, hold workshops for all of our women um, about resume building and things like that. Um, and um, we have a, hold on a second. <laughs> We have a women's awareness chair, and she decided that she wanted to do some protesting on campus. And it was called Her Time, and it's about um, basically um, our bodies. And she wanted to just have a women's movement, a women's march. And last summer, I was a English um, teacher for um, Breakthrough Providence, and I was facilitating um, conversations around gentrification and redlining and, um, and gender to students who are from Providence Public Schools, um, which was a great opportunity, and I met Yohaida. Um, but yeah, that is what I do. The University of Rhode Island is pretty interesting. We're not really as progressive as other schools. It's mostly, most of our advocacy is through conversations and kind of just being in those white spaces and representing people of color, unfortunately. We're not, we're not protesting. We're not um, doing things like PC. Um, but we're in the works of that. Okay, thank you. Yo, Hi, so. Hi, so I'm Yohaida. Um, I'm from Providence, Rhode Island. I grew up here um, all of my life. I went to high school, well, elementary and high school at Times Square at STEM Academy. It's a charter school. And during my time there, I wanted to, it's a STEM school, and I noticed that there are no women of color, there are no, there's not many women of color and not many women in STEM jobs. Um, and for us to see a lack of representation in those jobs, we're not gonna really wanna go into them. So for my senior projects, I really wanted to um, make a difference and I really wanted to do something that would help me, help me and help the students, and so, I started the STEMINIST, um, STEMINIST program for the girls of color in our school because it's a school with a majority of black and Hispanic students um, that are taught STEM. Um, it's a really great curriculum and we learn a lot. And I feel like a lot of the girls that are taught these things, we don't see, uh, most of the teachers there, um, we have a lot of teachers that are obviously teaching us these STEM and engineering classes, but when they go into the field, are we gonna see people like us in those fields? It's so I taught them that, and it was a gr it was um, it was an experience for us both the students and I. Every day after school, just teaching them about women's studies, teaching them about um, teaching them about STEM and the connection between the two. Um, and with that, after that program, it got me into the women's march and the. Rhode Island's Women's March at the State House. So there, I got to be the youth ambassador, and I got to talk about my experience with the girls at my school and what we did, and how that was really um, something that should be imp implemented in more schools. Um, definitely, Times Square Academy is a great school for for that to be like. Not a lot of children are getting STEM and engineering programs taught to them. So that is like a privilege in, in itself. So that gave me some empowerment and de like developed my identity with who I am as like a woman and my activism started there. And so from there on, I taught at Breakthrough Providence that summer and we taught about gentrification and redlining with students and I noticed that my activism that I taught with students, I found my voice. So talking to them helped me find more about myself and helping them find a voice kind of, it was like a back and forth thing with fueling. So I realized then that um, my activism had to go forward. So in high school, I was dealing with a lot, um, I had some things going on and I wasn't really sure where I was going to go to school. And like a lot of students, um, I noticed last minute that I 
probably had to go. You know, I have a, a really, I have a, a mom that went through a lot of adversity herself and was like, you're going to school. You know, she wakes up every morning, you're going to school. So I, I had to go, so. Um, community College of Rhode Island it was, and I'm a political science major. And community college, I think, with this panel specifically, I was thinking a lot about it, and I'm gonna talk about that, because for a lot of, a lot of students out of community college, they think that, for me, it was, it wasn't a last resort, but it was definitely a motivation for me to do better with myself. Um, I didn't think that I was, throughout my freshman and sophomore year, I had all these aspirations, like, I wanna go to PC, I wanna go to Brown, I wanna do this, this, and that, and then life hits you, and then you end up finding your passions in your year, and I wanted to do, I wanna do activism, and I wanna do political science, but then you go, to community college and there are students with these same passions and these same aspirations, but you're in a completely different environment. So my experiences are gonna be a lot more different with other panelists because I'm in a majority community, like commuter um, environment where a lot of people are just on the go. They're there, they're getting their things. You have people that, are, that have families, some people just, our mothers, fathers, they're just trying to get their, trying, just, just trying to get a good degree, so. Um, but yeah, so I go to the community college of Rhode Island, hopefully transferring somewhere. Um, I did the Black Women and Girls Symposium last year at P um, Providence College with Professor Julia Zachary, which was amazing. Um, I got to be in an area with so many, like, so many amazing black women, and it was just like, I, to be, I come from a family where like, my mom was the first black woman, like the first woman to go to college. So I see her and she's always like motivated me to go to school. And so to just see so many other people and just like have that, it just made me feel really good about like, good about me going to school and like knowing that I have so much more to work for, so much more to do and Hopefully, like, hopefully with where I'm going that I can make more of a difference in other people's lives, so. And our last speaker, Gwen. Hello. Um, hi, everyone. So as Shamara mentioned right at the beginning, I, I'm a literary arts major, so I'm primar primarily a writer, and I believe in the power of stories. And how I came to activism at Brown is a testament of that. And so I will talk today not so much about the work that I've done, um, but more how I came to it. Because I think it, it speaks to the theme of this whole conference, and I'll get to it as I go. So the spring semester of my first year at Brown, I took West African Writers and the Political Kingdom with Professor Anani Gigiano here. Um, and it was in that class that I first learned about West African soldiers who had been compelled during the First World War, I think, um, by colonizing powers to fight on the side of the Allies. And while these men fought side by side with Europeans in a war that was not of their own making, they were reminded that they were regarded as less than. And these African soldiers were given uniforms um, like everybody else, but they were set apart by the fact that they were intentionally given no shoes. And so I heard this story um, spring semester, beginning of, and something in me broke because I'd spent most of my first semester at Brown struggling to stay afloat. I was struggling to stay afloat as a low-income international student. And there were many costs, um, both material and emotional, that I had not anticipated before coming to Brown. 
and in part that was because Brown had not been entirely honest with me and with themselves about whether they were fully prepared to bring and support low-income students of color to an institution such as this. There was the fact that as an international student, I had to pay high tax on my scholarship at the beginning of each semester, which is as ridiculous as it sounds because you're getting charged a thousand dollars for money that you receive because you can't afford to pay for education to begin with. And added to that, the cost of books and clothing appropriate for these ungodly Providence winters. <laughs> I was spending a lot of time just trying to make money so I could survive. And I could barely even enjoy most of what had been promised to me as a prospective student. I couldn't take a moment to enjoy the clubs that had been talked about. I couldn't, I couldn't take time to make new friends and spend time talking to the incredible brown students that I'd been told so much about. And that had been capped off in my first year um, by the fact that during winter break, along with other international students who couldn't afford to fly home, we were thrown randomly into separate towers of the most depressing building on campus, the Graduate Center, and no care was taken to make sure that we were all in one building, close enough to each other to make sure that nobody was secluded and alone for Christmas. No one bothered to check that we had food or money to buy food, despite the fact that there were no on-campus jobs during winter break and international students aren't allowed to work off campus. How did the university think we were feeding ourselves? And all this was happening as I quickly came to the realization that in many ways, to the university, I was just a great addition to their statistics. They could count me in the 8% of black students on campus, a number that allowed them to look great on brochures, but that also protected them from having to deal with the fact that African Americans in this country have been systematically and historically underserved by the education system, and universities like, like Brown only continue to reinforce this to, to this day. And to drive home the point that I was not valued in this space, the university was making clear its position on black thought, black knowledge, and black philosophy. Very few of my professors engaged with black thinkers in their lectures or in assigned readings by any black intellectuals. And with so few faculty of color who could help me navigate these issues, it was clear that Brown could not were chosen not to see that in having students like me here, but not making sure that we had the resource, that they had the resources and structures in place to support us, they were cheating us. And hearing that story of the West African soldiers, it dawned on me and my friend who was in the class with me that we had been granted admission to this university, but we were in many ways being reminded of our place. And we saw ourselves as having been donned in uniform, right down to the medals being placed around our necks but refused nonetheless the shoes that would make our journey here an easier one. And so together with a few other international students, we crafted a letter of petition and sent it to who was then Assistant Dean of International Student and Visitor Experience, Dean Shante Delalu. And from talking to her, I became aware that as low-income international students, we were not the only ones struggling. There were domestic students who prayed they would never get sick because they couldn't afford health care. And together with people from all backgrounds, our efforts led to many changes within this university, including an, a commitment to hiring more faculty of color through the diversity and, action, diversity and inclusion action plan, expanded financial, financial resources for low-income students through EGAP funds, um, which is overseen by an amazing woman, Dean Eli, who's also doing a lot of work in making sure that financial student support on campus is better, is done better. And while these changes are far from complete, they have already significantly altered of the lives of students who came after me. And I give this extended personal account because I think it highlights something important about memory in the context of generational activism. And here I invoke the words of the great Zora Neale Hurston, who taught us that if you are silent about your pain, it will kill you and say you enjoyed it. And her words are important because they remind us that when we write, sing, and create other historical markers of our struggles, 
we ensure that no one can, in their right mind, claim that we chose our oppressions or suffered them smilingly. And yes, Kanye West. But, be <laughs> but beyond that, those memories are important in helping people who come after us know that we, what we went through was unacceptable in our time and should not be tolerated in the times to come. Without connecting my struggles, my own struggles at Brown, with the story I heard of those soldiers, would I have had the courage to say that what I was going through was not okay? And without knowing that part of the reason that 65 black students walked out in 1968 was that they could see that the university did not value them and their knowledge, would I be, and today, would I, without that, would I be able to see that Brown's exclusion of African languages is simply a part of that? And stories told in every form, memorialized in different ways, are important in reminding us that we are all part of a larger narrative. I might never have had the courage to say, no, I deserve better as a student at this institution. Had I not connected my struggles to a larger struggle that people of color have faced for generations before me, both at the school and globally. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, the testimonies up here are amazing. So I just have uh, maybe two questions to kick off the conversation and then um, we would love uh, questions from the audience and there's two microphones in the aisles for folks to ask questions. Um, so the first question I have has everything to do with um, what you just presented, Gwen, and also, Meg, um, what you referenced in your piece um, in terms of the institutional legacies, racial legacies, that a lot of our institutions have and how those legacies affect your activism. Um, so, Meg, you spoke about how Bristol um, was sort of the site of the transatlantic tra slave trade. Um, so how being at that university, Roger Williams University, in the site of Bristol, how does that affect um, the activism that um, you do on campus? So a lot, of, a lot of people who actually are on campus, who are actually also from Bristol, a lot of them don't even know about the transatlantic slave trade and how it was such a strong hub within Bristol. So the thing is, though, with Roger Williams, it is it is um, majority a democratic liberal university, but it's just really on like the very shallow end of the spectrum. So whenever we bring up topics about activism, about issues such as Black Lives Matter, they're on board, but they don't 100% understand the issues. Um, I'm currently attending a senior seminar with a professor who teaches social justice. Um, he is a white professor who specializes in um, criminal justice outside of teaching um, the senior sem. And he, whenever he tries to teach the class, which is a predominantly white class, he teaches it in a way that is to protect the fragility of white pride, basically. And that seems to be a resounding theme regardless of whatever class you are in on campus whether if it's just an engineering class, an international business class, a senior seminar, and whatsoever. So in our, in our curriculum, you're required to have four generic gen ed studies called the core, and one of them is supposed to be about the study of humans and basically how we think. It's kind of like a psych class mixed with sociology. It's supposed to be focused towards social justice, but a lot of people, a lot of professors opt to not do that based on the fact that it is a predominantly white campus and we have to cradle this fragile white culture that exists in Roger Williams. So activism on a campus that is predominantly white with systems that support it, faculty, administration, and a president that actively supports this, it's incredibly difficult. And it honestly, um, it makes you feel as though you are alone and that when, and that a lot of other students who are similar to you, who have similar views, have to assimilate, they kind of stray away from it because they don't want to risk themselves being damaged by whatever it is that could possibly happen to them. And you can't blame them for it. It's just the situation of activism on a predominantly white campus is incredibly difficult because of the system that keeps it in place. 
Anyone else care to respond? Or? Um, so I'm not too well versed on like PC's history back then, but I do know that um, when it first started, it was an all male like school. There wasn't any women um, allowed to attend undergrad. There wasn't any women teaching either. Um, and the first class of women at PC was sometime in the 70s, and it's so recent that there's a dean at our school who was part of that first class, and she still works there. So um, I guess that the oppression there at PC, it, it stretches different lines, not just race. Um, and before that first class of women actually came, a friar, um, I forget the name of the book, or like the article he wrote, it was like, as a woman come or something, but he basically wrote this and explained all the terrible things that would happen um, because women were coming to Providence College to get an education. So, um, I don't know, I have my own issues, I guess, with the institution of religion, but um, I think that they've been responsible for a lot of different things that's happened in this world that doesn't really sit well with me. So, um, a lot of things at PC and like the history of what they're doing, like even like the activism, it isn't really that new. Like, students haven't taken over the president's office, but they've made demands before. They've had these same issues and like all the different alumni that's come back in these past few years and told us the stories that they've experienced are so similar to the ones that we're experiencing now. So um, I guess what I'll say on the history of PC is that again, like a lot of the things that happen are repeat offenses. Nothing's really new. It's just that people haven't really, I guess, had the means or had the ability to really like stand up in their face and tell them that it time's up, that we're not gonna keep dealing with this anymore. So. Um, I guess we, we stand on their shoulders, like the PC alum um, of color, and even like the women there who have had to deal with their fair share of, um, I'll just call it BS, I'm not gonna cuss here, um, but their fair share of stuff, so um, I guess that's, that's all I'll say for that for now. Um, there is a lot of history with Native Americans here in Rhode Island, um, and there is a tribe called the Narragansett Tribe, and um, I do know that URI is on that piece of land um, that belongs to them. So URI does profit from Native American land, um, but I do not believe that they give money back to them or any in that shape or form or help that community out. So I just have one more question, then we'll open it up. Um, the second question is, so right before this panel, um, there was a panel of SNCC and NAACP veterans that spoke about um, their organizing tradition. Um, and so my question is, how do you see the activism that you're doing on your campus as connected to longer traditions of activism, um, racial activism um, in the US or elsewhere? I can start by saying that um, a lot of the activism that went on right before Brown started looking at creating its diversity, inclusion, and action plan happened, I think, at the same time that um, the Black Lives Matter movement was um, very present in the media around 2016. Um, and there was um, there were also a lot of um, movements, campus-based uh, um, movements within the US and globally as well. There was the Fees Must Fall movement in South Africa. And I think thinking of all those things um, during my own time at Brown, I, it, it gave me hope to some to some extent, um, to think that one, I, I wasn't alone in, in what I was facing, but I, I wasn't alone in trying to fight what I was facing. Um, so yeah. um, I kind of talked about this before on our PowerPoint slide that had action um, with like the base building and like different tactics and um, different mobilization things that we use. I think we've kind of like um, incorporated both the things that SNCC and the NAACP has done um, over the years. Like the NAACP back then um, was more like focused on like the legal work and for focusing on different things that they can help 
um, institutionally change things so that, because um, we're like focusing on individual cases every time you can get redundant, but if you address it on a larger scale, um, like different court cases, Brown versus Board of Education, um, how Plessy versus Ferguson turned out, different things. Um, if you attack it on a wider scale, then you can address like the smaller things. And then we've also done like grassroots work in terms of like um, going to people's rooms or going up to people in the student center and trying to garner their interest or give them information um, during different um, like events on campus like family day or accepted students days. We made different pamphlets that had all our demands and different accounts of students and faculty and staff who are in, um, experiencing things. We handed out to incoming students, to parents, to just about anybody who come on campus. So a lot of our stuff, again, were very like um, strategic um, so that we were getting the word out and getting as many people aware with what was going on. Um, and I, I don't think a lot of that would have been possible without the people who did it before us. So um, definitely SNCC and OACP and different um, groups from back then um, influenced us highly. So we can go ahead and open it up to questions from the audience. There are um, two microphones, I think. Um, both should be working. You may, because, yeah, here we go. <laughs> um, because we kind of live in an age where millennials get all these bad, this bad rap. <laughs> um, and you all are clearly showing that that's just a media fiction in many ways. Um, but th the question I have is, um, as a professor at an institution that's predominantly white, I have a lot of students of color who come to me about social issues on campus. Um, I am a third year tenure track professor, so, I kind of have similar struggles in trying to kind of keep going, make sure I am able to attain tenure and stay there to help students. Um, and so I'm often um, struggling with how best I could assist them. And so I was wondering what role do faculty play for you? Also, what would you like more from faculty? Um, and um, in what way could we advocate for you even in the small ways, like, you know, um, when many of us are kind of pressed and feeling similar tensions as you. Okay, well, I'll go first. Um, thank you so much for your question. And um, first of all, I think the best way that you can support some students, especially those who are engaged with activism work, is if they if they feel comfortable with inviting you to some of their projects or their showcases, definitely come in and support them as well too, even when it comes to some sort of group organization or a meeting. I know a lot of professors um, on our campus, some of them go to the LGBTQ meetings just so that they can come and support um, the groups as well too. So I think being there for students and trying to make time I know that faculty is also, are also very busy, busier than students as well too. But if you could carve out a time where you are willing to spend some time and listen to them, I think that's very important. My boss is not only staff, but she's also faculty and she always makes time to listen to students because students have very little time to self-care or to self-soothe and sometimes one of the best ways for a student to self-soothe is to rent sometimes. And if you have an open door and an, and an open mind for some students, that helps a lot as well, too. Um, yeah, I'd be doing a great disservice if I didn't um, recognize the help that teachers, faculty have helped um, us throughout these past few years. Um, one of the slides we had talked about coalitions and alliances. so. I would say an alliance is more of a short-term thing, almost when you're like playing playground tag, where you team up with one person, say you won't tag each other, game's over, then you start over. But a coalition is more of a long-standing um, um, alliance, I'll say, that you have with that group. And on our campus, we have a group called the Coalition Against Racism, and it's a group of faculty who kind of do what you were talking about, help students and help us a lot with um, our activism work. When we first came as a group, um, a lot of the meetings we have with administrators and high-level um, 
um, stakeholders in the school would use their like political, bureaucratic, um, doctorate level language with us. And I was a sophomore at the, at the point, so I didn't really know everything that was happening. I didn't really, um, I didn't really know too much about PC, so I didn't know what was going on before we got here. So they were in those meetings with us and they would um, um, check people and they would actually say, actually, this isn't true, this is what happened. Or they would let us know that, oh, this person wasn't actually being truthful when they said they don't have the power to do this because five years ago they did X, Y, Z. Um, so they let us know when we were getting like the runaround and we were able to take that and then again learn and adapt from those and be able to address it better the next time. So um, and our, at our bi-weekly meetings as well too, sometimes we actually have some of those faculty members come and we strategize with them and they help us because a lot of them have experience. There's somebody, um, Dr. Eric Hirsch, who did a lot of activism work in Columbia in like the 90s with their disinvestment, uh, 90s and 80s, in, um, in terms of anti-apartheid movement and stuff like that. So there's a lot of experience at our school in the faculty with um, social movements. So we use them as much as they use us. And um, like I have all their phone numbers. And anytime I need them, they just know that we can call them. And um, we text, we call each other the same thing, too. So we have a great relationship with some of the faculty at our school. And um, I think they play just as much as a role as um, us as students, and the tenure part is really important too. Um, not having tenure, um, we've experienced how that makes stuff difficult for faculty. Um, and then in the, I guess the opposite spectrum, having tech tenure and how that really does help faculty in terms of being able to use their voice and not be um, hinged or um, held back by the fact that in a couple of years, your department is gonna be reviewing everything you've done. So if you're speaking out against the school or the department or X, Y, Z, they can just not approve you for tenure and that's it. And like, like what do you do from there? So we, we had to learn all those different complicated intricacies as well and the faculty helped us um, just about every step of the way. Um, I wanted to say thank you for asking your question because it really excited me because I thought of one person in my life that like really helped me in college. Um, her name is Shirley Consuegra and she's Afro-Colombian so I'm able to identify myself within her. And um, she's just helped me so much along my way. And um, an issue that I had like on my Baltimore trip to go to um, um, for spring break, um, the, the faculty on my staff were very scared to go into Baltimore because of the reports that have been happening about it being the most dangerous city right now in America. And um, unfortunately, we weren't able to do as much direct service in Baltimore because of the fear of my um, teachers. And um, on that trip, I struggled so much because I realized people are always identifying cities as the most dangerous and things like that. And it's majority people of color that live in those cities. And people label all the time on, at URI that, oh my gosh, I'm so scared of going into Providence. But I realized that is my home, and this is what people are labeling at it, it as. And I struggled with coming back from the trip and Shirley was able to help me so much. And I think just being, being there for conversations and just being there for your students and being real, um, because Shirley tells me, hey, like the fight does not end. Even when you're in these institutions as a faculty staff, she's still having these conversations about being inclusive and being diversity, um, I mean, diverse and like how people are still ignorant as, people working in these spaces and and it scares me unfortunately because I know I'm, I want to be a teacher at some point but um, so I would just say keep being real and listening to your students and um, I know I, I, at URI for clubs like there you do need a, an advisor of some sort and maybe you can um, I don't know how it is at your institution but maybe there are ways to do that because I know Shirley wants to do that um, especially with um, um, Latinos and Latinas. So yeah, thank you. So we have time for one more question. Um, hi, my name is Trinisha West. Um, I just graduated from Providence College. I was also on the board with um, Adriel and um, this question is more so for everyone else because um, I know that some of the all of you guys have had experiences with social movements, experiences with something that you're fighting back against, some kind of injustice, which means that there's likely a system fighting against you. 
fighting back. Um, so I just want to know about some of the opposition that you guys may have faced during your social social movements, um, during some of your fight, and how did you over, overcome those things? And lastly, what did that do for you as a person? Like, how, how did you build from that, learn from that, um, as far as your movement or your thinking progresses? Three-part question for you. So, um, for the for the petition that we put together as international students before it even became part of a wider Brown campus um, call for action from the university, I, I I'd sent out the a Google form to a number of African students uh, because I identify as African and had told them hey, I know you've gone through the same things that I'm going through. Why don't we put our voices together and let them know that this is what we're going through because maybe they don't know. And a response that I got from some of the people was that they felt that they would come off as ungrateful. And that's, a, that's something that, of course, I had struggled with personally. Um, but I realized then like, how much fear of how our actions would be perceived by other people is always at the back of our minds when we try and push for anything. And while I, I could respect that um, people felt uncomfortable and honestly were scared that Brown would perhaps pull funding that they needed to attend the school, I also realized that I couldn't live with that fear personally. I wouldn't be okay going through and realizing that every other student who came through this university would go through the same thing. And so drawing strength, I guess, from somewhere else other than fear is really the biggest lesson um, from that. Okay, so I don't know if some of you may have heard, but Roger Williams did have an issue with uh, our president, Farish, about how we had a certain problem with Columbus Day. Um, it was featured in the newspapers, um, in some newspapers, but it was a big issue because uh, the Multicultural Student Union and a bunch of other social justice-oriented groups had made a, had made a, um, a signed pledge to request that Columbus Day be changed to Indigenous Peoples Day. So our President Farish agreed that yes, we will change it to Indigenous Peoples Day. And then it was absolutely fine. It was on the calendars. It was Indigenous Peoples Day. And then the next semester rolled around when it was nearing Indigenous Peoples Day that it says Indigenous Peoples Week. Because according to President Farish, we should be celebrating Indigenous Peoples not just for one day, but for a whole week. And this was because the board of trustees had found out about it. They were very upset about it. And so he had to basically be on the fence in this sort of situation and to appease the board of trustees. And because of this, a lot of protests had happened. It was a very peaceful protest. But on indig nearing Indigenous Peoples Day, they brought in a speaker who was pro-Columbus Day. And one of the board of trustees, Mario J. Gabelli, who gave me a pretty big scholarship, <laughs> um, was there in support of the pro-Columbus Day. He was very anti-Indigenous Peoples Day. And a lot of people would say that, oh, if you want to be social justice, if you want to be equitable, then you know, like, why won't we talk about pro-Columbus Day instead of just Indigenous Peoples Day? Why won't we hear everyone else's ideas? But. Um, First of all, whose safety is being sacrificed and minimized to allow others to be comfortable maintaining the humanizing views? Because first of all, uh, Roger Williams was obviously on native ground, indigenous people's ground, which was the Wampanoag tribe. And it was pushed out when they started building the university. And that was a big issue that had been circulating. And we still don't have Indigenous Peoples Day. We have Indigenous Peoples Week, because according to our president, we should be celebrating it for more than a day. But we still have Columbus, Columbus Day. And also, another thing, <laughs> I can go on and on about this. But another thing is a lot of the people who do have 
like the high-ranking sort of hierarchical positions in our campus are usually headed by white student activists. And while that is not an issue, while I don't mind that if you are an ally, a lot of them turn their own, they don't understand their own positionality and how their power privilege, how their power and privilege is also oppressing us. They use it just so that they could put another bullet on their resume, and it's just the most aggravating thing in the world. They're just there to collect titles, and they're not really there to help marginalized identities. They use one small marginalized identities because they are either a woman or transgender or queer, and they use that to benefit their own system of, I feel like a good white person because I am helping these people. And there, there, I could go on and on about this, but I will stop right now. Thank you. <laughs> you had a, well, did you want to? Um, so at the, um, the campus that I go to at the Community College of Rhode Island, it's based in Lincoln. Um, so for that campus, it's kind of a far way out from Providence. Um, the Providence campus from my house would be much more of a distance as well, so I attend that campus. Um, there are no professors of color for me to even go to or have any classes with. Um, and the classes that are African American history are all online. Um, you can't take any of the classes with a professor. Um, and there are, have been some professors that have made jokes about Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, and have made jokes about Ferguson and have made jokes about people not having water, about people, um, just things that aren't funny at all. And it's a majority of people on that campus, um, the majority of people on that campus are white. It's like, and because it's a community campus, I mean, I'm sure there are people of color and black people like coming back and forth, but for us to even see each other would there's not really a, there's, it's hard for community colleges and kind of student unions to kind of organize. So for me, it's been hard to kind of come back at like the, the school itself and come to some sort of um, agreement to speak to like a, a dean or say something. Because how am I supposed to take like a, how am I supposed to learn about my history online like and have to teach myself um, and it's like a web online class, like that, that makes no sense. So it's been like a constant struggle with that. Um, recently, um, URI posted a picture about, of the um, new cheerleader team, and there was one person of color and she was light-skinned. And um, your, um, a lot of people had a big issue about this because of URI will use us for orientation, for um, their posters, for things that they send to other students of their, um, like um, to, to get them to campus, like newsletters and things like that. They will use our faces and people were very upset about the cheerleader team not being diverse at all. And there were women of color who were on the team, cheerleaded for two years and did not make the team this year. So people were highly upset. Um, and then also URI uses, uh, URI has a campus um, like in, in Kingston, but then they also have the Providence campus, and they use the diversity of the Providence campus and URI's small campus to make their number larger in diversity, so people were very upset about that. And we were, um, a lot of people were, you know, commenting on the picture. They never took it down, they never closed the comments, but no one ever said anything. And that's something that URI does all the time. There will be an issue and they'll just hide it under the rug. URI is very good at, um, like, hiding um, the history of, or, um, of, like, protests that people have done on campus. Um, so it's really hard because people do feel passionate about these issues, but they just feel, they are comfortable, unfortunately. They're like, we can't complain, you know, like we have, a, we're able to be on here um, on this campus. Um, I don't know, it's kind of hard and it's, it is frustrating because we all want to create change, but we don't really know how to all the time, unfortunately. Um, so like this past year, oh yeah, P PC has millions um, of problems. So I, we could be here all day if I went through them. Um, <laughs> but I guess, 
one thing I'll mention is like this past year, Princeton Review ranked PC number one as the least um, race and class interaction. So it virtually ranked us number one in like the most segregated school in the country. And this is a school in Providence, Rhode Island, not in like Montgomery, Alabama. So if you're looking at the history of what we're told segregation is, it's usually the South and they don't really focus on the North. So for a school in Providence, Rhode Island to have that ranking, especially a school that's so small, there's only like 3,700 students at the school. So to get that ranking, I mean, it kind of like validated everything that we were doing for the past few years and like people before us. Um, but the pushback we get is from everybody. It's from the students, from the faculty, from staff, from alumni, from the board of trustees, um, you name it. And there's probably been some type of some dignitary from a constituency that has um, tried to defame us, try to do all these different types of things. So. Um, to really go on specific examples, I could, there's too many to really go over, but I think that Princeton Review ranking as number one was really like a eye-opening thing to a lot of people because, again, they try to hide things that happen so much, so people really were on the campus, outside the campus, didn't know the things that were happening um, until we like forced it to be publicized. And then Princeton Review gave us that ranking, so it was just like, it was really like, here's the body of work that actually happens at PC. Like, they tell you something, but this is reality, and then um, that ranking came out. It's not like we were pushing for that ranking. We, I didn't even know that Princeton Review did stuff like that, but it just popped up on my timeline, and I saw it, and I was just like, we're not crazy, because a lot of the things that they um, try and do is make it seem like we're literally imagining the things that happened to us. So um, I'll just leave it there. So listening to all of these panelists and the issues that they raise, I think shows that there is a collective organizing tradition across campuses in Rhode Island where students are confronting issues of racial injustice in their local communities and connecting them to national and global movements for transformation. So please join me in thanking all of the panelists. And and in thanking the Race, Memory, and Memorialization Committee for including this panel as a part of the conference. Thank you so much.